Tonight's episode is brought to you by First Cup Coffee Company. If you're looking for a Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company that also happens to be serving a mean cup of joe, check out First Cup Coffee Company. There's a flavor for every freedom-loving American. It ships within days uh, of being roasted, and honestly, First Cup places the first the roast uh, date on each bag, so you know what's going on. Go to firstcup.com, use the code STEW to save an additional 10% on your order. And if you subscribe, you'll save an additional 10% on the life of your subscription. That's firstcup.com. The promo code is STU. Have to check, uh, for sure to check out the new podcast series, excuse me, State of the Race. It's wherever you get your Studios America podcast. It'll be right in the feed. It's a bonus pod. You'll still get this show as well, and it's free to you. We'll have a brand new episode tomorrow morning as we head into the New Hampshire primary. Everything you need to know about the election. We're also free on YouTube, youtube.com slash America, at least for this show. That's uh, the uh, State of the Race is audio only. Uh, for the time being. Uh, like our videos on YouTube, click the bell for notifications, help support the show. We do appreciate it when you do that. Steve Baker is here with the latest in the investigation of January 6th. I've got a few election updates as we head into tomorrow's primary in New Hampshire, but we start by doing the DeSantis campaign autopsy. A lot of, it's a tough day for a lot of the DeSantis supporters who fought really hard, have a really good candidate, a really good governor, uh, someone we've spoken highly of on this program for a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on back and forth online. Everyone hates each other. This is this the typical dumb primary nonsense where everyone has to hate each other and everyone has to be scorned for a while. It, it's raw right now. We have to understand that. Uh, this is a typical day for people who worked really hard for a guy who I think would be a very good president and may still become one someday in the future. Ron DeSantis ends his presidential campaign and endorses Donald Trump. We've got a clip of the announcement, and here is the governor. Nobody worked harder, and we left it all out on the field. Now, following our second place finish in Iowa, we've prayed and deliberated on the way forward. If there was anything I could do to produce a favorable outcome, more campaign stops, more interviews, I would do it. But I can't ask our supporters to volunteer their time and donate their resources if we don't have a clear path to victory. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises, and I will not stop now. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. They watch his presidency get stymied by relentless resistance, and they see Democrats using lawfare this day to attack him. Well, I've had disagreements with Donald Trump, such as on the coronavirus pandemic and his elevation of Anthony Fauci. Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. That is clear. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear a repackage formed of warmed over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. <laughs> One thing is clear. Uh, he hates Nikki Haley, and Nikki Haley hates him. Uh, DeSantis' exit was a parting shot at Haley, and it was. I mean, because there was a talk at one point, oh, if you get down to a two-person race, it could be close, and who knows? DeSantis did not want that, did not want a two-person race. He wanted a one-person race, Donald Tr him versus Donald Trump or just Donald Trump. Nikki Haley does not, he doesn't want any piece of that. And really there was, there's been like real bad blood, I think, between those two over the past uh, short amount of time. And it's funny because like Trump has that way uh, with him and he has that sort of built into his character where people know he's going to say terrible things about you when you're his opponent. And in a second, you're his friend. He's gonna, they're going to say, he's going to say nice things about you. That's just kind of the way it works uh, with Donald Trump. Where it doesn't feel personal because he kind of does it to everybody, right? Like it's, it comes and it goes. With Nikki Haley, it feels real. They really don't seem like they like each other. Uh, Trump, of course, celebrated DeSantis's decision to drop out as he's stepped closer to securing the nomination, and he has declared Ron DeSanctimonious uh, officially retired. Now, no word on DeSanctus. We don't know if DeSanctus has been retired yet, but we guess. I guess we do know about Ron DeSanctimonious. Here is uh, Donald Trump announcing that. 
Okay. You just said, will I be using the name Ron De Sanctimonious? I said, that name is officially retired. <laughs> It's interesting because he said this a couple times. And listen to the crowd reaction to that. Like, this is the thing with DeSantis. He's not unpopular among Trump supporters. They wanted Trump more, but they like DeSantis. And I don't think they ever really warmed to his attacking DeSantis. They just decided to choose Donald Trump. And I thought maybe today would be a, a, we could do a little exercise of going through the DeSantis campaign and asking a lot of the big questions and try to answer a lot of the big questions about how this went, why it went the way that it did, and what can change in the future for not only DeSantis, but any Republican candidate that wants to avoid the same fate as Ron DeSantis. Question number one is, should he have run at all? I mean, that was kind of the initial argument from Donald Trump and, and many others. This is not your time. It's, it's Trump's time. Should he have run at all? My answer to that is yes. I think he should have run, and I think it was the right time for him to run. Now, it didn't work out, so of course you can easily go back and second-guess it. Uh, you know, like in a football game, like you're like, should we have gone for two in that situation? Well, it didn't work, so no, we shouldn't have. Well, maybe it was still the right play, even if it didn't work out. And I think that's kind of where we are with DeSantis. Look, we've seen this happen to person after person after person over the years. If you let the moment where you're hot go by without running, generally speaking, it doesn't turn out well in the end. Uh, Chris Christie is the sort of ultimate example of this. In 2012, he was really one of those candidates that looked like he was on the rise. He was doing a lot in the blue state. We didn't know a lot about him yet. And that was really his moment to run. He decided not to. He waited till 2016. It was never an impact and obviously was not an impact in 2024 either. Ron DeSantis had a moment. He had a chance to do something here. And if things had broken another way, maybe he would have. It really was sort of impossible for him to know not only that 91 indictments were coming, but how people would react to them. Now, we could have guessed and maybe he could have looked at that and said, you know what, I'm not even going to bother running. But if he ever wanted to be president of the United States, it was probably a good idea to run. So let's go to some, some more of the specifics. Should he have launched the campaign earlier. This was something that was talked about a lot at the time. You know, he waited quite a while. He wound up launching his campaign on May 24th. Remember, his big victory happens in November. He's riding high. He's very close to Donald Trump there for a little while. And then he waits and he waits and he waits and he waits. And he does some things in Florida. And honestly, I don't think it was a crazy decision. Um, he decided instead of getting, he's not going to win or lose the race in, in March and April and February, right? He's, let's let some time go by. I'll do what I can in Florida, get my job done there, do as much as I can in a quick period of time. I'll have a lot of uh, accomplishments to come to the people with and then try to win the campaign then. I can see how it works on paper, but it didn't wind up working, especially after these indictments came in. This is a Steve Kornacki tweet, and you can see that he, what he's talking about here. The shift came abruptly, the, a clear rally around Trump effect among GOP voters when the news of the first indictment broke in March 23. Look how the polling average diverged at that moment and never looked back. And you see a pretty competitive race. Again, you're still talking about a 15 point race. So it's he was never that close, but about a 15 point race between January and March within striking distance for if you run a positive campaign and, and do well. But then it just drops off as soon as that mugshot hits the hits the papers. It is down, 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 down for DeSantis and up, 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 up for Trump. And it made it. I don't know. Would you say impossible? We'll ask that question here in a couple of minutes. Uh, next up uh, for the Ron DeSantis campaign question, should he have launched a campaign on Twitter? Well, it's pretty easy to say now. The answer to that was no, largely because the camp, the t the actual Twitter spaces situation didn't work. Uh, it was like streaming in 1998. It was not exactly a successful and did not work at all. But I mean, it's important. A lot of times we get hung up on these moments, right? This moment that helps our narrative of how we're going to understand a campaign. But the truth is, if Donald, if he had had a traditional launch with a wonderful commercial showing his lovely family in Florida and all the accomplishments, would this have turned out any differently? I mean, come on. I don't think it's a big factor at all. So I would not have launched on Twitter the way that he did. However, is it a big factor in the result? I think the answer to that is no. How about going up against Disney? Was going against Disney the right decision? The reason I bring this one up is a story from Business Insider that says Ron DeSantis' campaign was over 
when he decided to have a popularity contest against Mickey Mouse. Now, I, there's an argument, I suppose, to be made in the general election. Some of that stuff may have hurt him. Maybe some uh, independents would have frowned upon him going after some of these companies and picking a fight with Mickey Mouse. But it did not hurt him in the primaries. This was not something that hurt him in the primaries at all. Uh, Donald Trump tried to separate himself a little bit there, but never really went hard on that fact. The only person who really went hard on it was Nikki Haley. Now, Haley outlasts DeSantis. In some ways, the retrospective of these campaigns will say that Nikki Haley finished in second. It's questionable, honestly. It's like saying John Kasich finished in second in 2016. Well, he lasted the longest, but Cruz clearly had a much more of an impact on the race. Haley, we'll see. I mean, she's got uh, she's still got room to go here. She will get a chance to show what she can do in New Hampshire and South Carolina. We'll see if she does do that. But honestly, like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that that was a factor. The Disney part, I think, if anything, probably helped him with some voters in the Republican primary. Next up for Ron DeSantis, should he have been more aggressive in going after Trump? I hear this one a lot. And it's an understandable question because... It's hard to beat someone you're not criticizing. It's hard to beat someone you're not saying, um, you're bringing up arguments against. If you say, well, Donald Trump was like the Vivek Ramaswamy approach. uh, Donald Trump was the greatest president of my lifetime, but I will be slightly younger and slightly better. Vote for me. It's a hard sell, right? If you say, well, Donald Trump blew it on X, Y, and Z, and he was actually a terrible president, and he's probably going to be a felon and blah, 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 then you're Chris Christie, right? So... He tried to, again, find that middle point where he could be critical about. He even mentioned this in his exit video there. Uh, you know, be critical about the 2020 uh, Fauci situation. Be critical about him not being able to build the wall. Be critical of his spending, but still be respectful and say overall it was a good presidency. We can just make it better. It's just a nuanced argument. You know, you, when you're advertising, when you're running a campaign, you want to you want to kind of paint these broad black and white contrasts with your opponent. And the DeSantis approach didn't really allow for that. Now, again, was it the wrong move? I don't think so. I think he had to try to find a mid ground here because if he came out and acted like Chris Christie, he would have had the fate of Chris Christie. And I don't know how you would have been able to survive that. You wind up being so unpopular with Trump voters, there's not a pocket for you. And that's what Christie, of course, found out. So now I don't think he, it's necessarily, maybe he could have been a little more aggressive, really going after that. And, you know, the fighting with the end of Nikki Haley, I don't know what good that does, right? What, what, what was the point of that? I mean, it doesn't make much of a difference. You're fighting with someone for third place. He probably should have been a little more aggressive or at least maybe, and I don't want to say, angry or mean, because I don't think that would have been successful, but just a little more aggressive going after those points. Do, would that make a difference? Though probably not, um, but may have been a little bit of a positive if he could have done it right. Um, did he run a good campaign overall? Look, I think the answer to this question is no. Okay, He is a good candidate. He is a good governor. He's very well spoken. The campaign apparatus around him did have a lot of problems. We've talked about the launch. We've talked about uh, 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 over, the, over the past months, he raised a heck of a lot of money and went through it very quickly. He blew up his campaign into a very large size with really showing optimism, didn't really hold, probably didn't bail on that structure quickly enough, uh, wound up dumping all of his money into Iowa, which then didn't work. Uh, his super PAC had all sorts of infighting going on, people leaving, people fighting with each other. All that's true, but like, would this result really look differently if the super PAC and everybody in it got along really well and they're all hanging out on Friday nights? I mean, probably not, right? This is the problem with, I think, the analysis around DeSantis. It's been focused for months and months and months and months about all the things that DeSantis did wrong. And it's not to say that there aren't any. I mean, he's even outlined some of them. My big criticism of the DeSantis campaign rollout was not about Twitter as much as it was, go out to the media, go on MSNBC, fight with these media members and show how well you will do in that type of format. He's done that a few times and he's done really well with it. He's good in those moments. Instead, he tried to stay more toward friendly media. He's criticized this about himself. There are things to criticize, a lot of things maybe, about the Ron DeSantis campaign. But focusing on that is like focusing on the 20% 20 of the problem while leaving 80% of the problem unaddressed. 
You know, it's like trying to lose weight by, you know, putting gluten-free buns on your double cheeseburgers. I don't know, maybe it has some sort of effect, but it's not going to get you to a thinner waistline. It's just not going to happen. It's not the big part of it. The big part of it is the cheese and the burger and the bacon, right? That's and the mayonnaise and, and all the other delicious condiments. Now I'm getting hungry. You know, it's just not going to work overall, Okay. Uh, it, you know, a lot of people do this where you're making, you know, a, a salary that you're not particularly happy with, but you spend a lot of time thinking about your investments. Well, if you don't have money to invest, uh, you're, you're kind of focusing on a small part of the problem. And I think that's what this was. There's a much bigger issue here. And the issue is the strength of Donald Trump with Republican primary voters. It, you know, and I, I bring the, I, I, I come back to this point a lot. And the next question is, did he ever really stand a chance? And I come back to this point a lot. A lot of the people who say DeSantis did a bad job are people who are big Trump supporters. You'd kind of expect that, right? We're in the middle of a competition here. So you expect DeSantis uh, voters and Trump voters to butt heads sometimes. But Trump voters will point out all the things that DeSantis did wrong. Okay, fair enough. But if DeSantis ran a perfect campaign, would he have beaten your guy? I think every Trump supporter I've ever met in my entire life would say, no, of course not. Trump's awesome. He's going to win anyway. Is there really a way he could have won? Let me give you a couple pieces of evidence. Um, you know, because I mean, this is in some ways it's like he's just a very strong candidate. He has unique abilities. He is a former president. He's very famous. He's been aggrieved in so many ways, as we as we've covered. And he has a real lock on Republican primary voters. And in some way, I think it's it's akin to arguing Beyonce has the greatest album of all time when you're speaking to an audience that's 70% Swifty. Like, doesn't matter if you have a better record. Doesn't matter if it's been produced technically uh, in a superior fashion. They like the Taylor Swift songs. They don't like the Beyonce songs as much, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, Should he have, and this comes back to another kind of fundamental part, and this is where I think it breaks down. Should he have argued more aggressively that Trump lost in 2020? And look, he could not convince people on his own of this. But if the approach was to try to take him out, it would have been a lot more productive to not necessarily argue about his policies, but just argue that he hadn't he didn't actually win. Now, I want to take this out and I I try to bring this up all the time because I don't really care what you think and you don't care what I think about the election. It doesn't matter. At this point, the elections, I mean, look, you know, you can complain about a bad call, but if your team is advancing and they're playing in the next round, uh, you know, if they are or they aren't right. Um, The same thing here. We all know Joe Biden is unfortunately in the White House. We all know how that turned out. But there was a a internalizing of Donald Trump's narrative on the 2020 election. And just think about this from a mercenary politician strategist viewpoint. If you want to beat Donald Trump. You can't have a situation where Republican primary voters believe two to one that the the election was stolen, because, of course, if the election was stolen, people are going to rush to Donald Trump and defend his honor. This plays out. This is polling from New Hampshire. Uh, The breakdown of voters who believe Biden won the 2020 election by fraud. Who wins that? Donald Trump overwhelmingly. Eighty two to eight. So. Again, you can't win an election if two thirds of the voting population believes something that will vote 82 uh, percent for your opponent. There's just no way to win. Now, of course, people who don't believe that, that believe that Biden won fair and square. And I think a lot of people are kind of in between these two positions, but the poll only broke them out this way. Nikki Haley wins easily 71 to 14 over Trump. DeSantis only gets six. This is, of course, New Hampshire. The point is that with that fundamental structure of two thirds of the audience basically going completely to Trump, you can see how it's hard to get to 50 percent for the other candidates. This isn't a knock on Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley or anybody else who ran. It was a setup that basically made it impossible between the 2020 election situation and then the indictments on top of it made it basically impossible for anyone to beat Donald Trump. And Trump is a good front runner and he won one uh, easily. Now, part of the reason why this is happening is, is the, you know, the writings of Jonathan Haidt we've talked about many times. Two of the most uh, important characteristics to a conservative mind are fairness versus cheating the 2020 election, and loyalty versus betrayal. 
Well, if you believe someone had the election stolen from them, of course you can't betray them and let them go. You're loyal to them. You want them to get another chance. It's only fair. And without disarming that argument, again, from a purely political strategy viewpoint, there's almost no path to victory. Now, we've been talking about the two-tier primary. Nikki has a chance uh, here. Nikki Haley has a chance in Iowa, or excuse me, in New Hampshire, and then South Carolina to make her argument in that top-tier primary. Who's going to win? But we're close to the end of that here. We don't know the second tier. If Trump has legal issues, we're going to deal with that later. Trump will likely win the nomination, and the general is still up for grabs. It's still very close, even though this is, to understand this, the best polling position Donald Trump has ever been in in any of his presidential runs, all three of them. He's never had better poll numbers than he does right now. So that is important. He's leading this race right now, but it's still dangerously close. Biden is bad enough for him to actually lose this race. It's, this is, I know I'm going to shock the media, but that is definitely true. And if you really think Trump is Hitler, you'd think that what you'd be doing is trying to uh, empower his opponents. That's not what the media has done. They've gone the other way and they've taken this risk and said, we can beat Donald Trump. Well, they're going to find out if that's true, most likely coming very soon to an election venue near you. History, economics, the great works of literature, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. Did you study these things in school? Eh, probably not. Not that much, at least. Or if you did, maybe it's time for a refresher uh, because time and technology have changed lots of things, but they have not changed the basic fundamental truths about the world, about our place in it. And that's why I'm excited that Hillsdale College is offering more than 40 free online courses in the most important and enduring subjects. You can learn about the works of C.S. Lewis, the stories in the book of Genesis, the meaning of the U.S. Constitution, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic. I've learned lately that men think about the Roman Republic every single day. So now you can actually know something about it as well. Or maybe the history of the ancient Christian church with Hillsdale College's online courses that are available for free. Uh, for free. Why would you not want to learn about this stuff for free? It's incredible. Uh, check out American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hansen, for example. It's an eight-lecture course. Uh, Hansen explores the, uh, the history of citizenship in the West and the threats it faces today. Threats like the erosion of the middle class, the disappearance of our borders, the growth of an unaccountable deep state, and the rise of globalist organizations. The course is self-paced, so you can start whenever you want and end it whenever you want. And you can start your free course, American Citizenship and Its Decline, with Victor David Hansen right now. Go to hillsdale.edu slash stew. Uh, you can start there. It's free. It's easy to get started. Check it out now. Learn this stuff. It's really important. hillsdale.edu slash stew. hillsdale.edu slash stew. I'm joined now by Steve Baker. He's an investigative journalist and Blaze Media contributor. His latest piece is Revealed, a plainclothes Capitol cop found the DNC pipe bomb. Be sure to check this out now at theblaze.com. Steve, how are you these days? How's everything going with you? <laughs> you know, actually, I'm doing pretty well. That's good to hear. That's, yeah. that's good to hear. Well, you've got a lot going on uh, in, in your life that I want to get to here. <laughs> but let's start with the pipe bomb, your, your yeah. latest piece. This has been a fascinating story from the beginning because it, it, it was a big piece of what happened on January 6th. And then it kind of just got forgotten. We were told there was bombs planted at the uh, DNC and the RNC. Um, and, you know, we kind of knew, uh, was it the DNC? There was one we, we knew that was a woman, right, who found yes, it. Yes, that's correct. We knew about her and she did a little, a couple interviews here, but really not a lot of mm -hmm. attention paid to that. We didn't have any idea, seemingly, who found the RNC bomb or the DNC, DNC bomb. bomb. I'm getting in the backwards. Sorry. <laughs> right. So uh, you know the story better than anybody. Walk me through it. It's, it's very simple. There, just before the first barricade breach at the Capitol, which happened at about uh, oh, 12, 52, 53 p.m., Trump was still on stage. The first barricade, that was the famous Ray Epps breach. And mm -hmm. that's when they first started st storming the Capitol, we'll yeah. call it. Mm -hmm. um, and just before that, minutes before that, the, there was a bomb found by this uh, woman at the RNC. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets to see that because it was down inside an alley. So nobody really gets to see her from camera angles find that. But the Capitol Police Bomb Squad, they did everything by the book at the RNC. They cordoned off, they put out the police tape, they evacuated, they did everything that they were supposed to do by the book. 
But what's been withheld from the country for so, well, for three years is the fact that over at the DNC, nothing was done by the book. Because just minutes after the barricade breach, approximately 105, is when this quote unquote, for three years, we've been told that it was a passerby, walked up to, uh, there was two, par- uh, two cars parked in the driveway of the DNC. Now that's actually the parking ramp. It's much, more, it's much larger than just a driveway. But sure. It's the parking ramp entrance into, uh, underneath the building. So there was a Metropolitan Police car and a Secret Service, one of the big black SUVs parked in the driveway. And we also was, were withheld for a year that Kamala Harris, the then vice president-elect, was inside the building mm-hmm. when this bomb was found. I mean, that's amazing. It's amazing that they withheld that for a solid year. And that affected actual trials because in some of the J6 trials, people's sentencing and their charges were being enhanced because they were being told that they were attacking a building where the vice president-elect was in, which was the Capitol, and she wasn't there. Mm. So they had to actually go back and do superseding indictments and remove that information from their charging documents. So that, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And so back to the DNC. So this passerby walks up to the, uh, casually walks up to the uh, Metropolitan Police car, uh, it's a little, you know, SUV, and he talks on one side, and then he walks to the driver's side, and then he walks around casually to the passenger side, he talks there, and then he walks back around, and he comes to the um, Secret Service vehicle, and he talks to them, and then he just disappears. He wanders off. Mm-hmm. And so for three years, he's been a passerby. And then the most inexplicable part of it all was is that the, the Secret Service guy and whoever was in the car with him, they decided to finish their sandwich first before they got out. No, they had just been told there was a bomb, and that bomb was 15 feet from them. Now, I've had some really good sandwiches in my life, uh, Steve. So, I mean, could it just have been that good of a sandwich? I mean, I don't know that I've had a sandwich good enough to, to not freak out if a bomb was 15 feet away from me. But I've heard you're a Taco Bell fan. So. <laughs> I am. Well, Taco Bell is another story. If I was right. having Taco Bell, right. then maybe I would. You might finish it. But this is, like, number one, self-preservation, right? Like, there's a bomb 15 feet away from you. Right. Number two, we now know it was a capital cop. This is not just a passerby. Because, right. I mean, look, you could see a situation. You're, you're around Washington, D.C. Some crazy-looking person comes up, says there's a bomb. You don't believe them. Like, not normally how police would react, or a Secret Service certainly right. would react, but you could kind of understand how that would be possible. This is a D.C. cop of some sort, a capital cop. So credibility, right? right? I see a bomb. There's credibility there. And then add on to the fact that the vice president-elect uh, is inside the building this has to be the ultimate top priority immediately. As good as the uh, you know blimpy sandwich was, this yep. is a time to skedaddle and make sure this bomb is taken care of immediately. That's not what they do. It's I mean that's right. that's really suspicious. It, it's very suspicious, and and you you hit the you hit the nail on the head. They should have been hair teeth and eyeballs coming out of the you know those those car doors. Mm-hmm. They should have been immediately coming out. And as you said, if it had been, uh, you know, just a, a regular schmo wandering off the street and said, hey, I think there's a suspicious thing or package over there. I can see, you know, okay, the last two or three bites of your sandwich. And they're, you know, they shrug and they sure. roll their eyes and they get up <laughs> yeah, and go yeah, and do, yeah. the, do the thing. But they've got, as you said, they've got the VP elect inside the building. And this is an actual plain clothes Capitol Police officer who most certainly said to them, there's a bomb over here. It's got the timer on it, etc. Or did he? Hmm. We don't know. So we don't know what he said. No, we don't know yet. Well, we don't know, but from my congressional sources, because I got this verified before we published, I had this verified from three different high-ranking congressional aides that were in the room when he was finally interviewed by congressional committee. And so they all verified that this was a true story. They do, in fact, know his name. And I actually asked for the permission to release his name on background or however they would allow me. They withheld my permission to do that until they have the opportunity to spend more time with him because they think he's going to be a credible witness going forward. Uh, actually, some of the committees really liked him and they think that, that he might have more to share and they don't want to scare him off and ha- have him you know, plead the fifth. Mm-hmm. So what's the motivation here? Right. Like, I, I mean, I know you it's a bit of speculation I'm asking you for, but like part of me that that might struggle with this story a little bit is like, 
What's the motivation of, 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 of a couple of uh, Secret Service members to not react to this news? Why wouldn't they do this? What, would, what, they, what could possibly be right. the motivation? Well, it's, 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 <laughs> it's far worse than that. And, and this was revealed because, you know, Darren Beatty, uh, Beatty, he did a reveal on this, a very, very long and, and an exhaustive story mm-hmm. uh, the day after my story came out. And what he showed was a much longer situation where it was lackadaisical by all of the officers that were arriving. Additional Secret Service, additional um, uh, Capitol Police, a, a, additional Metropolitan Police. They never cordoned off the area. They never taped off. There were children and families walking within 10 feet of the bomb, and you don't see a single officer or agent of any type running over to those families and go, no, 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 get across the street. Come with me, come with me. They never did that. There's something wrong in that situation. Yeah. I'm prepared to tell you this, is that because of our time with Blaze Analysts in the Capitol CCTV, uh, CCTV viewing room in D.C., we have much more coming mm. that nobody has seen yet. And um, it, it's, it's going to answer some of these questions, okay. but it's going to make us ask a ton more because nothing makes sense, Stu, in, in this situation. It really doesn't. No. Uh, I, it's, it's a fascinating story, and I, I know you've got more coming on it. I, I, when, you, when you get to this, I'd love to have you back on to talk about it because this is a story that's been developing, and you've been breaking basically every little piece of this, so thank you so much for doing that. The thank you from the government for doing that has been different. They've come. They've decided to thank you in a very special way by inviting you over. Yeah, um, well. which is really nice of them. Um, you have had a legal situation with the January six uh, situation for a while. They have for years. They did not come to you. They seemingly this was a dead. I mean, you're a journalist, and yeah. there's New York Times journalists in the building at the time. Tons of journalists in the building at the time. Right. Suddenly you're singled out and they do seem to be coming after you. What's the status of this right now? The status is simply this. You may remember uh, just before Christmas, a week and a half before Christmas, uh, we received notice uh, from my attorney or from the FBI uh, agent to my attorney that I was going to have to surrender myself, actually, in my where I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, mm. uh, like four or five days later. And then, you know, thankfully, you guys at The Blaze went into high gear. Other media began to cover this immediately. Uh, you know, had something like, you know, mil- well, we had millions of views of the, of the X posts that went out mm-hmm. uh, that night. And so we got another call from the FBI. They backed off. They said, okay, we're going to wait for your self-surrender until after Christmas. Okay. So then that was nice. It's a nice yeah. little Christmas present. Yeah, for yeah us, it was. Steve. It yeah. was. Yeah. It was <laughs> yeah, with a bow. Yeah. And and, and so they they uh, then my lead attorney was able to reach the new assistant U.S. attorney that now has my case in D.C. And so they were able to reach out to them and they had a conversation. And they said they're going to withhold or they were going to delay again my quote unquote self surrender till sometime in mid January, and that they would give me seven to ten days notice for me to make that self-presentation. So gracious of them. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Well, now here we are on the, what is it, the 22nd of Mm -hmm. January. We still haven't heard from them. No news whatsoever. And uh, we're not getting return calls. My attorney's not. And they've done this to us before. After the first time that they told me that they were going to charge me with something, this was in November of 21, and then they went silent for 20 months. So we just don't know where this is right now. We have no idea. But uh, we did release a press release. My, my six attorneys released, uh, crafted this weekend, a, a press release that went out and was released this morning. And um, we're basically d- demanding, challenging the Department of Justice to go ahead and do what they're going to do. Or let's just stop this nonsense because they put me through this now for two and a half years of coming to me, pulling back, coming to me, pulling back. And they know because they got me on a, they got me on a thousand cameras too. Yeah. They know I did no violence. They know I didn't break anything. They know I didn't attack anybody. They know that I was doing my job as a journalist that day while I was inside that building, just as sixty other uh, journalists that walked through open doors and busted windows that mm-hmm. day and won awards for it. And yes, yeah, some some absolutely did. And so uh, it's either it's either charge me or charge all of us. I, and, and you know what? Let's do that. Yeah. I really like that fight. <laughs> that would be a fascinating fight. But they wouldn't. They would never do no, it. Right. Of course not. Is this is, is their continued pursuit of you uh, retribution? 
Are they coming after you because of the earlier stories we've talked about where you're reporting on this stuff, you're exposing a lot of uncomfortable facts for them, you're making their lives a little miserable. Are they coming after you because of that? In the first um, week of August, when I first started talking to Matt Peterson, Hmm. the Blaze Mm editor-in-chief, was when they showed up again at my doorstep, figuratively, after 20 months of silence, coincidentally, Mm. with a grand jury subpoena this time. And then we break two of the most important stories that we've ever broken, two of the most important stories, I think, in post-January 6th uh, news cycle, and they popped up again. You tell me. Is this a coincidence? <laughs> it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it. It's, My attorneys don't think so. No, they no, don't. I mean, don't I, it so. just seems directly related, especially just the timeline plays out that way. Yep. And look, if it's not, then they should answer, right? I mean, just be upfront about it uh, and and do what they're going to do. But it would be nice if they would at least give you some sort of closure on this, uh, which is it's got to be really tough on you and, and, and everybody around you. That's uh, that's all I want right now is I want closure. Mm. You know, I, I, I pray every morning, let this cup pass from me. Mm. But if if we have to do this, if we have to go through this to bring even more light to the situation, to the selective prosecutions, to the malfeasance that we, I've personally witnessed by the Department of Justice in many of these trials. If we have to do it, we have to do it. Well, you should live by my rules, which is it's too cold in, in D.C. in January. So just never go in that time period, and then, then you would have been fine. But It's too cold in the studio in January. <laughs> it is. It's always cold here. <laughs> Steve Baker, investigative journalist, Blaze Media correspondent. Be sure to read his latest. It's revealed a plainclothes capital cop found the DNC pipe bombs. Available right now at theblaze.com as well as all the other articles. There's tons of stuff that Steve has been uncovering on this. And it's stuff that nobody else is doing the work on. So it's really important. We always uh, ask you to subscribe to Blaze, uh, blazetv.com slash stew. Promo code is stew if you want to do that there. Because you get access to all of Steve's pieces and everybody else at the Blaze and also all the video elements. There's a lot to the membership, but really most importantly, it's supporting this type of stuff. Because, I mean, you know, we were talking about this off the air. It's like without... If we if we kind of if we don't stand together, we're all hanging separately. Uh, we've heard that before, and it's really important that we do that. Steve, thanks so much for all the work you're doing. Thank you, Stu. Well, NBC News has a story out. Nikki Haley finally has the one-on-one match she's craved. It may be too late. I mean, they only had one caucus. I mean, it's too late. I, if she was going to win this, she should still have a path to win it. Unfortunately, it's going to be a very difficult road. Uh, new CNN poll has Trump over um, Haley by double digits in New Hampshire. Um, it, it was closer. I mean, at one point, I think the last CNN poll had her up uh, down by seven. Um, again, American Research Group still continues to churn out polling showing this race much, much closer, but they are in disagreement with every other poll. So we will see if that holds up. Uh, tomorrow on State of the Race, the audio podcast you can get on the Studios America feed, uh, we're going to go through all this stuff. We'll give you all the latest polls that have uh, gone on and everything you need going into the New Hampshire primary. I think you'll, uh, you'll enjoy that as, you know, maybe we don't have a primary for much longer. And it's kind of po- possible that this thing sort of winds up quickly then we're kind of into a law and order episode where we watch to see what happens to Donald Trump in court, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. This has been the most bizarre, bizarre election cycle we've ever seen. Um, however, uh, Tim Scott. Now, Tim Scott, uh, over the weekend, actually wound up endorsing Donald Trump, which is, I think it was over the weekend, or was it Friday? Anyway, it was a big get for Trump uh, going into New Hampshire, largely because, you know, he's another S- South Carolina guy. He had a decent following in the South Carolina primary. Um, this is something that, you know, could help uh, sink Nikki Haley if uh, and it's also quite a statement against Haley. Right. Like, I mean, you know, you're another South Carolina person. You're coming out before her big race and endorsing her opponent. It's tough, tough if you're Nikki Haley. Not something you want. Um, however, he did have some good news over the weekend as well. He uh, got uh, engaged. Yeah. Tim Scott engaged uh, to be married to his fiance. 
this happened uh, on Kiowa Island, which uh, if you happen to be a golf or tennis aficionado, uh, aficionado, I cannot recommend it enough. It's quite nice. It's quite a nice place to go. You love it there. You love the luxury. But it's a very nice uh, place and uh, very nice for him. Good congratulations to Tim Scott. And... Doug Bergamentum. Bergam- like, I have a theory about Bergamentum. I'll let you know in a minute. But uh, his presidential bit, bit is over. He is not going to seek a third term as a governor. So Bergamentum, you'd say, oh, gosh, it's dying on the vine here. This is so sad. But no, this is when, and this is just my, I don't have any insight on this. Uh, this is not reporting. This is my belief. This is when Doug Burgum re-announces he's running for president and wipes the field clean. Mm-hmm. This is when it happens. Actually, I do think there's a good chance that Burgum is looking at a cabinet post with Trump. He, had, he did uh, endorse quickly. Uh, he has a lot of money, which Trump usually, uh, you know, he likes hanging with other billionaires. He usually respects them at some level. And Burgum did have a pretty good record as governor. So you could see him as a secretary of, I don't know, the interior or something. Uh, so we will see if there is a gig for Doug Burgumentum going forward. Back in a second. So my wife got arrested. I'm pretty sure a uh, woman arrested after police found $2,500 worth of Stanley cups in her car. So I'm pretty sure my wife got arrested. Look at this picture again, because I want you to look at this picture closely, and I'll paint the picture for you on podcast. It is a cop car with I don't $2,500 of Stanley cups laid out all over the, the hood of the car and in front of the car, tons and tons and tons of Stanley cups. You know, these cups keep your cold drinks cold, your warm drinks warm. And they're great, but uh, people are obsessed with them. And especially my wife is obsessed with them. That picture you're looking at right now looks like the cabinet inside my home. That's what it looks like. In case you ever wanted to have a preview, just instead of it being a cop car, put like, you know, a little, it has a little glass, a little uh, wood door with a little glass windows in it. And then you see behind that, nothing but Stanley Cups. Um, We've kept the company going now. I, I, I think they would go bankrupt if she stopped buying them. But just so you know, it could be a crime, dear. So please stop. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we have a new, and you're going to be excited about this one. Joe Biden is announcing new abortion initiatives to mark the Roe anniversary. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, you know, there's nothing like another initiative to help children not be born. It's such a wonderful thing to shoot for. Wouldn't it be great if all the children of the world never became children at all? Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful goal? Well, you'll get some new initiatives to make that happen. Obviously, this is what the pattern is with the administration. When they get a Supreme Court ruling they don't like, they just go around it. They act like it doesn't matter. And then they say, well, what about our institutions? I don't understand why Donald Trump doesn't like our institutions so much. Hold on, let me go around it for student loans and eviction moratoriums and 55 other things. Uh, By the way, if you want some actual merch that you might care about, go to studosmerch.com. Get the 62422 merch. That date, well, that's the date Roe versus Wade was overturned, a very important date in American history. And you can uh, think about that as we get closer to that, uh, that uh, uh, anniversary and mark the anniversary with the 62422 merch. And it's great because, you know, people will come up to you and go, hey, what's 62422? What, what happened that day? You'll know. You can choose whether you want to either tell them the truth or just make fun of them by saying like, you know, oh, it's the invention of the hush puppies, I mean, whatever you want to say. Um, but uh, either that or you can say, oh, it was actually a date uh, where children were allowed to be born in a bunch of states. Uh, so that's kind of positive. So check it out. StuDoesMerch.com. Code is Stu10 if you want to save 10%. Well, a new poll says the vast majority of voters in uh, America are unenthusiastic about a Trump-Biden mismatch. I, it depends, I guess, how you look at it. Do you look at it this like, you know, Ali Frazier 2, these two titans battling it out again? Or is it like, a, it feel like a, I don't know, completely unnecessary reboot of some crappy movie? Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the new dynamics of new people, new things to talk about, but I guess this is what we're getting probably. Anyway, uh, we will keep following all the details on the State of the Race podcast, which you get for free on the audio side, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, it's State of the Race with Stu Gear available under the Stu Does America banner. So just subscribe there. You'll get it for free in your feed every day. We'll have a new episode coming up tomorrow. We'll have another one reviewing the New Hampshire results this week. So don't miss it. We'll see you tomorrow.